During the year of 1942, a series of dramatic battles unfolded around the remote railway halt of El Alamein, located 120 kilometers west of Alexandria in Egypt. The 9th Australian Division, fighting as a member of the Commonwealth 8th Army, thwarted a determined German-Italian offensive aimed at invading Egypt and seizing control of the strategic Suez Canal. It stands as a defining moment for the Australian Division, who played an instrumental role in securing a decisive Allied victory during the Second World War. In fact, British General Bernard Montgomery said of the battle that, the more I think of it, the more I realize that winning was only made possible by the bravery of the 9th Australian Division. Australia's commitment to the war effort included land, sea and air operations in North Africa. Following the Nazi conquest of Western Europe, the British Empire, along with its Commonwealth partners, served as the last line of defence against Axis ambitions. Australian, Indian, New Zealand and South African forces collectively formed a sizeable part of the Allied defence in North Africa, safeguarding the vital Suez Canal, a lifeline connecting Britain to its Asian and Australasian territories. The Mediterranean and its surrounding shores emerged as a major theatre of conflict from the onset of hostilities in the region in mid-1940, coinciding with Mussolini's entry into the war. Australian troops were already training in the Middle East when Italy's forces crossed into Egypt in late 1940. Their engagement spanned land, sea and air, encompassing relentless combat over the Mediterranean. Early in 1941, the Italian forces faced mounting challenges and the arrival of the German Africa Corps, led by the charismatic and formidable Erwin Rommel, escalated the intensity of the conflict. This marked the beginning of significant offensives in Libya and Egypt throughout 1941 and into 1942. The Royal Australian Air Force played an important role in North Africa, notably three and 450 Kitty Hawk fighter squadrons that made up part of the Desert Air Force. Hundreds of Australian aircrew served alongside their British and New Zealand counterparts. Approximately 10% of aircrew in British squadrons hailed from Australia, having been trained under the Empire Air Training Scheme. Their service encompassed a wide range of roles, from the first Spitfire squadron to arrive in Egypt in mid-1942 to Blenheim and Boston light bomber squadrons. RAAF personnel also operated Hudson bombers, targeting Axis supply lines. Furthermore, over 200 RAAF aircrew were integral members of the long-range Wellington bomber squadrons within 205 Group, stationed in Egypt and conducting missions across North Africa and the Mediterranean. One outstanding Australian fighter pilot who fought in this North African theatre was Robert Henry Maxwell Gibbs, otherwise known as Bobby Gibbs. During his two years flying Kitty Hawks in the Middle East, he completed 473 operational flying hours, took part in 224 separate sorties, engaged in 33 combats, and destroyed 10 enemy aircraft with five probable and nine damaged. He had a keen knowledge of tactics, had superlative judgment, and was an outstanding leader. What follows is Bobby Gibbs' own personal account of the El Alamein conflict and fighting the Germans in the air over North Africa. In the background, we will play Bobby's own home movie he shot while flying with number three squadron in the Middle East. Well, we were, we were based near at an aerodrome called Amaria, just out of Alexandria. So we were in a good position to give fighter cover to the bomber boys going over uh, the, the Alamein area. So we did quite a lot of fighter work over there, we like, and uh, the Germans were quite anxious to have a look too, so we had a few combats in the area. I was leading a squadron one day, and we were vectored onto uh, an enemy formation, and um, we were attacked by two or three 109s that went in, and they managed to cut off the bolt of my squadron, and um, they were sort of back mixing it but we were escorting another squadron, uh, a low cover. We were hot, top cover, they were below us. So we had to stay over them, and just the three of us went on. We ran into a Balbo of 30 plus uh, 109s and Mackie two, twos, escorting a lot of Stukas underneath. Now the other squadron got stuck in the Stukas and they played hell with the Stukas, but we got stuck in, well, they, the 30-plus enemy airplanes got stuck into the three of us, and we had a 
hell of a battle. And one of the chaps, Tommy Woods, who was uh, he was a uh, he had an oil oil smeared windscreen, and he he wasn't able to see too well. So he survived by sheer luck, and uh, unfortunately he died only the other day. But uh, we had a most horrific combat, and I think the thing was the, there were so many enemy aeroplanes trying to get at us; they were all getting in each other's way, and well, we. I, I think I got one of them, but that's about all we got confirmed out of it. But we, the three of us survived, which is quite amazing. And the boys down below, of course, they they didn't have any problem from the one and I because they were too busy trying to clean us up. <laughs> what about um, uh, combat with the with the German fighters? Uh, what were they like as uh, as combat pilots? Well, the German pilots at uh, the beginning were all highly experienced. Um, Later, the, the, the quality fell off a bit as we managed to kill them off. But um, the um, one combat we had, we had 27 aces against us, we discovered later. <laughs> After the war, we discovered this, and no wonder we didn't fare that well that day. But the, the German fighter pilot was good. If they stayed in and tried to dogfight us, they were gone because we could outturn them. But they were had better aeroplanes, they, they had a better ceiling. They had a ceiling of 30,000 odd feet. We had a ceiling of useful ceiling up to about 16 or 18,000 feet. And they, we went off badly after that. We could outturn them, we could outdive them, but they could outclimb us, they were faster and had a better ceiling. So they were always above us. They used uh, pick and zoom attacks. They'd come down at, uh, at great speed go through our formation, shooting, and we'd get a fleeting shot on them only. And uh, it was quite amazing, but we actually got two uh, two enemy aeroplanes for every one we lost in the final roundup. And considering they had very much better aeroplanes, uh, we, you know, I think we did pretty well. I put in one or two of my combat reports, please give me 109s. <laughs> How do you account for those successes? Well, I think we worked as a team. Uh, we we stuck together as a team and uh, fought as a team. And we this business of running away on your own is not not good practice. They one of the permanent officers who came over to take over from me. He was a uh, very brave but very stupid because he wouldn't listen to anyone. And last scene, he was chasing a mob of 109s on his own. And all I can think of, he must have caught them because we never saw him again. <laughs> but this is why we did well. I think we stayed together and we fought, fought together. And uh, our tactics were better. Well, they had to be better. But uh, the 109s, I think they, we had c certain ones. We had a lone character called Marseille used to come over. He shot down a few of ours. But one day he claimed something like eight or nine uh, of our fighter force in North Africa, and uh, we didn't lose any that day. So I don't know what his score really was. They, I think he undoubtedly, I watched him shoot down two or three of my people. He doubted he was good, but this day I think he put a bit of a swifty over him. I was talking to one of the J commanding officers of JU uh, 87 after the war. He was, came and stayed with me, actually, and I uh, was having a chat to him, and I said, well, you know, these, some of these scores, they sounded amazing. He said, but, oh, he said, Bobby, they, uh, we had to help the morale of the people at home. <laughs> and the, I think a lot of the, some of the top scoring people didn't get it quite as many as they claimed. Thank goodness. Tell me about the, the longest combat that you were in, engaged in at that stage. I don't even like to think about it. <laughs> we, um, we were, we were um, two squadrons that went out on a sweep over the forward areas and we saw three 109s coming towards us, above us, and they turned, uh, they went turned anti-clockwise around us. And uh, so this leader of our gaggle, Peter Jeffrey, started following them around. And after a while, they were joined by a lot more 109s up on top. And we ultimately got into what they called a defensive circle, 
because one aircraft following the other, if someone attacked you, uh, you, the one behind should be able to get a shot at it. The theory was wonderful, but it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, we were pretty well over German aerodromes. We were very, very close to the German aerodrome where the one and I's were, had come from. And uh, they, they were a stack of the daily things, and there were two of our squ- two squadrons of Kitty Hawks, and the Tomahawks in those days. And um, it was a horrible business. Went on and on and on. We were gradually forced down, uh, lower and lower. We were over enemy territory, so the the guns were shooting up at us, and they one and not coming down on us. And we had a, a very miserable time. It was terrifying. And um, after one hour and f- five minutes of combat, I thought well, we we had lost. We'd forgotten. We didn't know who the CO was anymore. Who was leading? So I sort of uh, I could see they were thinning a bit, so I broke away and waggled my wings, hoping the mob would follow me. I wanted to get home before I, ran out, before I ran out of petrol. And not a soul followed, so I got back in great terror and joined. Next time I waggled my wings, and uh, the mob followed me almost as one, and we didn't see another 109 then. We landed at a forward aerodrome, which we had only just captured, and all of us out of petrol. We were almost, com- almost completely out of petrol, and coming on dark. And uh, we were lucky to get away with it. Six of our people were missing out of the 12. We lost three in the morning, all killed in the morning. In the afternoon, three of them, uh, two of them were taken prisoner. One walked home, and we had about three killed in the afternoon. So we had a, a busy day. If you were only working with 18 aircraft, 18 pilots working of a little squadron formations of 12, it was pretty disastrous. My morale, of course, was... <laughs> I didn't have any after that. I, uh, I didn't think I could go on. I'd had uh, an hour, about an hour and a half of actual combat during that one day, and uh, the... Um, it, you know, my, my morale is, it was bedrock, and I used to go back to the operations tent and pretend I wanted to f- join the next flight, have another crack at them, but I, underneath I d- didn't want to do that at all. It was just a show. And luckily, the next one or two flights I went on, we uh, didn't have any real combat, so my morale gradually returned, and I was right again. But, oh, I nearly turned it in a, and I would have been in great shame if I would have never got over it if I had, of course. I got shot down the first time by a rear gunner from JU-88, the German bombers. They were flying in di- what we call diamond formation, uh, just a triangle. And I was shooting at the gentleman in the rear of the diamond and some nasty gunner in one of the other 88s set my engine on fire, and which wasn't very good. <laughs> I had a long thought of how, how I'd get out. So I, in this case, I, because some of the boys had tried to get out uh, uh, with their parachutes caught over the back of the canopy, and they were spread eagle and couldn't get free. And uh, one of them survive by at the last minute by getting his foot under the joystick and pulling it back and he went in flat and he survived it, and I was frightened that might happen to me so I rolled on my back thinking this is a way to get out and I had wound the trim forward so when I released the joystick I was shot out like a, a bullet because I had, hadn't allowed for the aerial <laughs> I got tangled up in the aerial. I hit the tailplane, or it hit me. I've still got a mark on my knee where I hit the tailplane, tail fin, and I got wrapped up in this blasted aerial. <laughs> and on the way down, I eventually got the aerial away from me, pulled my ripcord, and uh, the um, parachute opened. And then I heard, I watched my aeroplane going down, it was burning fiercely on the way, and I saw it hit. And then I suddenly heard, the roar of an aeroplane. And now one of our pilots, Dudley Park, had been shot out of his parachute in a previous dogfight shortly before this. And I thought, my God, they're coming after me. And uh, I started climbing up on the shrouds trying to make myself a difficult target. And uh, 
And then I suddenly, the noise built up to a crescendo, and suddenly there's a mighty woof. I had actually watched this, it took the noise probably a second or two to get to me, and uh, that was a second or two of real terror. <laughs> Yeah, yes, unfortunately, another time. <laughs> I got shot up another, uh, badly on another time, and I had to, f couldn't get my wheels down, they shot my hydraulics away. And I thought if they had any beer at the mess, it would be the place to be. So I <laughs> crash landed the aeroplane right alongside the mess and got the hell of a row. This was when I was a flying officer, got the hell of a row from the CO. <laughs> but there was no beer in the mess anyway, it turned out, so I messed out. The other time when I really shot down, it was um, towards the end of the, the show in Africa. We are escorting a mob of bombers, and you want to know all about it? <laughs> right, from, 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 we were escorting uh, bombers, uh, the American bombers, and we had to form up at low altitude to keep below the radar, as you say, under 500 feet. And we had to go across, we we're going to raid a place called Burdufan. And uh, we formed up with the American squadron at low altitude, and they all formed up very nicely, and away we all went, sticking down low. Now, I was the leader of the whole thing. The fighter leader was in, uh, in charge of the bombers too. He could turn them back if he wanted, if it became necessary. And we were hoping to have the element of surprise uh, like flying over the water at low altitude, coming in over the land, and then we'd climb so we could bomb this aerodrome, Bird of Fan. Two 109s flew over when we were halfway across the bay, and uh, as was, was no, they obviously had seen us, so reconnaissance aircraft. I, I then gave the instructions to climb, so we all climbed like mad. By the time we got over the coast, the whole Luftwaffe was there waiting for us, and uh, this is where we had all these aces that they we discovered later. Anyway, one of them went in over the coast with a stack of one and I was picking at us. We had some spitfires as top cover. They were so damn high they didn't see a thing. <laughs> they didn't come into it at all. But the um, one and I were coming down like rockets onto us, trying to go to the top squadrons who were. We had three squadrons above us, other than the spitfires who were way up. And uh, they were coming through at high speed and uh, trying to get the bombers. We were trying to, and we were obviously keeping them off the bombers. One of our pilots was shot down before we got to the aerodrome. And after we were climbing up to form, to catch up on the way home, uh, the show was all over. I looked down, one of my pilots was down below being shot up by three 109s. So I, I called up our squadron. I, they had the, the, the squadron above us was supposed to be the attack squadron. I was supposed to stay right alongside the bombers. I called the film to go down and help him, someone to go down, and uh, no one went. I gave a couple of calls, and it was quite serious. So I um, obeyed, disobeyed all instructions. The war, yeah, they were on the way home anyway, so I dived down to try and help. I got there too late. Just as I got there, I... There were, the, there were three 109 attacking. I hit the lead 109. I think I got him. In the meantime, I watched my buddy go in and burn furiously. And I, so I started then climbing up to try and catch the formation with the remaining two 109s chasing me. We had learned how to avoid a 109 attack from a stern by skidding slightly by skinning your airplane slightly so it wouldn't be apparent to the guy shooting at you, but the bullets would go to one side. And then you'd wait to see the black coming off his wings to show his guns were firing. And then you'd take a violent evasive action from that juncture. And I had done this two or three times and I was catching up with the formation above. And uh, the, the, uh, suddenly someone up above screamed, look out down below. And um, I had lost sight of one of the 109s. I was watching an attack come in, but I'd lost the other one. So I panicked, and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and I, I turned, did a 360-degree turn. I went right through his cone of fire and got a, a, 40, a cannon in the motor, which didn't seem to help much. And so <laughs> I went down. I was fairly high by then, so I went, I put in a vertical dive. I knew I'd had it, went straight down, and 
built up a speed of over 300 miles an hour. The 219 turn came after me, so I, when I, I didn't want to get my, have my controls shot away. I thought if they hit my elevators, I, I would go straight in I, without control. So I pushed it onto the deck. I was still doing 300 when I last <laughs> looked at the airspeed, and it's all fairly flat country with just a bit of salt was around. So I, I probably bounced for four or five miles before I came to rest. And the meter came to rest, I clambered out on the wing and the two 109s came in. I thought, oh God, they're going to strafe me. They didn't, they wave, They went past at low altitude and one of them either waved or saluted and uh, they were decent people. They, 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 they probably knew I'd be picked up anyway. <laughs> anyway, I got home from that one. After the Battle of El Alamein, the 9th Division had withdrawn, as had the Navy, while the RAAF remained. Here's one more story from Bobby as he talks about fighting the Germans under Field Marshal Rommel. They stopped at the Marath Line, what they call the Marath Line, the line of mountains just behind. And uh, he stopped there and it looked as if it would be very hard to uh, get, get past him there. And um, this is where I had, uh, uh, next, I had a forced landing there, That's, which is quite an unusual one, but I can tell you, if, if you want to know, if I'm not being too, it doesn't reflect too well on me. <laughs> we used to carry um, two 250 uh, pound bombs on our wings, but they were fitted with nose, ro nose rods, an 18 inch nose rod, which meant they'd, they, they'd explode before they hit the ground and burst outwards rather than just dig a big hole. They, the theory was they'd kill more people that way. <laughs> this was the nose rod. And we're lined up at the, on the, at the aerodrome just near the Marath line. Normally we had big square aerodromes so you'd have 12 aircraft taking off and lying abreast and 12 aircraft coming in the other way when the dust had settled and so on. But this time we were on runways and we could only take off three at a time. I was lined up on the end of the runway and the squadron had take, taken off just before me and one of the pilots had an engine failure so he turned back and uh, <clears throat> as he came downwind about probably half a mile out from the aerodrome he dropped his two bombs with the nose rods and he was blown right out of the air and it was a horrible blast at sight of course. And then I, I saw I opened the taps to take off and uh, I had one on each side of me. And as I got air, just airborne, I suddenly thought, my God, my motor's running rough. And um, I, I realized that I was in trouble, so I tried to wave my tooth. I didn't want to break radio silence because you didn't want the enemy to know you're on the way. So I was trying to wave them away to get rid of them because if I had, I would have been able to turn back and, uh, and drop my bomb at a reasonable height. But by the time I got rid of them, I was right over wing headquarters. And uh, I thought, well, if I drop my bomb now, they <laughs> might be too popular with the old Brits <laughs> and the army boys. So I, uh, there was a deep wadi ahead, of quite a deep, wide wadi. And uh, I thought, now, if I drop my bombs over the wadi and turn hard right down the wadi, the bombs will go that way, I'll be going this way. And uh, they, I have a chance of survival. And as it happened, I turned around, they, the bombs didn't go off, they never were found. I, I, they must have landed flat and skipped and well, that low. Anyway, I went down the wadi, and ahead of me, there was a road with traffic, army traffic going backwards and forwards, a lot of telegraph wires over the top of it. And I was running out of sp airspeed very rapidly. I thought if I <clears throat> try to go over the wires, I'll stall. If I go under the wires, I'll hit a truck. So, so all I could do was go through the wires. And I landed in this wadi with huge ruddy rocks, quite big ones, coming through. My airplane, the belly was torn to pieces. The wings were torn to pieces. The wings were hitting underneath some of the rocks and tossing them up. And I was watching them. And eventually I came to a halt and there petrol flowing everywhere. And I couldn't get out of it fast enough. I thought it would know, go up in flames. And as I start to run, there was a, a, a Tommy on the side saying, Stay there, Tommy, you're in a fucking minefield. And 
I won't tell you what I said about the minefield, but I, I started taking very much bigger steps, <laughs> terrified. But I, luckily, I, I got away with it. Got back to the back to the squadron. Tried to get hold of another aeroplane. At least I put on a pretense of trying, but I was so blasted terrified. I, I was pleased when there was not another aeroplane, so I couldn't catch up with the squadron. We were operating from a, an aerodrome called Marble Arch in Tripolitania, and um, the army wanted to know what action, what was, was happening behind lines of a certain little aerodrome called Hun, uh, it's now known as Hon, H-O-N, which was H-U-N in those days. It's about 180 miles inland from where Marble Arch, where we took off. So I took a little team of six people out to carry out a reconnaissance of this aerodrome. We put on our long-range tanks because we, in, instead of just going 180 miles there and back, I wanted to get further into the desert to see if there was anything else happening behind. When we got over, inside of Hom, Hom Aerodrome, uh, which is quite a big square aerodrome with trees and things around it, and uh, there are a lot of aerodrome, aer aeroplanes parked around the perimeters. And as we were, had a complete element of surprise, I couldn't resist it. I said, well, yeah, let's go and have a do something about this. <clears throat> so I went in and we strafed. We went through and burnt several aeroplanes. One aircraft I shot at was a Savoia 79. It must have been full of ammunition because it blew up. And as I went through the blast, a huge blast, it, uh, my tail plane lifted up me with a stick hard back. I was going straight towards the ground until I came out. I thought my tail had been blasted off. But that I survived that. That was okay. So then we had a complete element of surprise. So I, not a shot had been fired, so I came back and we did a second run through. Now, normally you'd only do it once because more than that it could be dangerous. But this time I took a chance and went through the second time. This second time we had a few shots fired, but nothing much. But I had a new flight commander there uh, who had been sent over to take over the squadron from me, a permanent officer. And uh, he, um, he, he didn't know the danger. And he turned and to go in again. So I called up and I said, for goodness sake, don't do that. Stay, stay awake, come and join up. But he went in and two of my other, uh, three of my other pilots followed him. And uh, it was inevitable. One of them uh, was uh, shot down, and the other one was hit in the air, and he went in flaming. He tried to uh, land it instead of pulling up and bailing out, and he rolled the aircraft up. Of course, he was killed. <clears throat> and one of them went down, a chap called Bailey, uh, fairly near the aerodrome. So I, I, thought, I thought, well, you know, we haven't been very nice to these people. They, they won't treat him very well, <laughs> so... I uh, called up and asked him what the, weather, uh, t uh, what the terrain was like uh, so I could probably pick him up. He said, no, don't, don't. He said, it's impossible down here and uh, you haven't, you, there's no chance of your landing. But I found another spot about a couple of miles away, uh, quite a good spot, and I landed. I was a bit, a bit wary about landing because I had holes through the top of my main planes where I'd gone through this bomb blast. I thought if one of them hit a tyre, I'd be in great trouble. So I touched down very gingerly. If uh, I'd realised that if I'd had a tyre flat, I would have taken off straight away without coming to a halt. While I, in other words, while I could. However, everything was right and I'd landed. I tacked it in as far as I could to get towards him and from a devious route. And uh, then I, <clears throat> when I couldn't go any further, I stopped the motor got out and I had a, a long-range tank on which was still half full of petrol so I knew I'd have a, a very hard job getting off because there wasn't much room so I dropped the tank and I pulled it aside and uh, in those days I was much stronger than I am now but even then it was a terrific effort pulling this, this half full tank of petrol to one side putting it out of the way 
I waited until I was there, probably the best part of an hour. And I was just saying out on my radio, I told the people circling overhead to stay, anything that started coming out towards me to shoot it up. I thought the, the, they'd come out from the aerodrome. They, I was also expecting them to probably shoot at me, but evidently the, the guns were in a position where they could um, fire ground to air, but not along the ground. And then probably they couldn't, they couldn't get a line on me, so luckily there were no shots. However, I was in a state of terror, thinking, what the hell have I done this for? <laughs> and uh, waited, and eventually he got to me, and he was um, panting and hot as blazes, of course, and so I threw my parachute out. He, he got in, I sat on his lap, and I only had a very short area to take off. I've forgotten the dis forget the distance. Now, I don't think only three or 400 yards, which wasn't enough, I knew that. So I revved my motor up to full blast on standing on brakes and put a little little bit of flap down, which made me get off a bit earlier. And I took a, that way we went. <clears throat> we hadn't reached flying speed when we came to the wadi, a wadi ahead. Uh, we, we were flown into the air and uh, we hit the other side of the wadi with a hell of a thump. And one of my wheels, I, then with all the dust, I saw one of the wheels bowling back behind me, my port wheel. And I thought, God, there's another wadi up ahead, and we looked like hitting it. And I thought, if we hit that, we're in, <laughs> we're in trouble. So I dropped my right wheel, no, I didn't have a left one, and um, thinking, well, that might take the bounce. But I was very really lucky. We cleared by a matter of inches, I suppose, and flew on. Now, the next thing, of course, I was worried about was uh, whether we'd, we'd been there for a long while, whether the enemy would have aeroplanes there to, to greet us on the way home. And I thought, well, <laughs> it won't be much fun if I have to go through a dogfight with this bloke sitting on, <laughs> under my backside. So when I got to the aerodrome, we hadn't been picked up, luckily. When I got the, near the aerodrome, I called up the... Firstly, I couldn't talk to this guy because the noise was terrific uh, with the huge Allison motor in front. So I wrote on the map... I would like to try a one-wheel landing if this is okay with you. So he, not, he read it and nodded agreement. So I called up Wing and I said, I'm oh, coming in, uh, crosswind, please have an ambulance standing by in case anything goes wrong. And I, I was very fortunate. I could probably try this a hundred other times and never get away with it. But I landed on the one wheel with the wind from the port side and as I lost speed, I deliberately kicked on a little bit of rudder to swing it to the port. So the, the, the weight of the aeroplane was thrown out all the way, and I almost came to complete stop before I came to rest. And we got out. The aeroplane was flying again three weeks later. I had saved the aeroplane, and uh, we needed them desperately. They patched up the few holes in the wings and so on. Well, that, that was all that was about. Harry Broadhurst, uh, the AOC, Harry Broadhurst, put me up for a major gong at that stage. They downgraded it to a DSO. <laughs>